We're glad that you've chosen to come worship with us today. As I said earlier, we have started out in the Advent week. Uh, this is Hope, and we uh, hope that you are happy that you're here. We were kind of joking in prayer with the word hope. And uh, it's amazing how many times you can say hope a lot. But anyway, in our world today, we kind of hope a lot of things. So what's the difference between hope and faith? Hope and faith, there's a difference. Faith is something in which we're looking, and we have faith in God because of historically it's done. Hope, we're hoping something takes place, but we're putting a faith into it, but we step back, and sometimes there's a little bit of doubt and hope, and sometimes we wrestle with a little bit of doubt and faith, but they complement one another. So as we enter into this time, as we lit the Advent candle of hope, which is also the prophecy candle, and that being said is because of all the messianic prophecies that have been fulfilled with Jesus coming, uh, Summer read the one that said, for unto you a child will be born through a virgin. So that prophecy was fulfilled, which we'll get into here in a moment, through Mary. And so as we look, as we enter into this Advent season, the whole Advent season is geared towards, and maybe some of you are aware of this if you're from traditional background, if you've come up through the Mennonite faith, you're aware of what Advent is because it's something that's seen, it's something that's recognized and honored. So for those of you that don't, what it is is a preparatory time of preparing our hearts for the coming of Christ. Now, we look back in history because as they, as the Israelites, looked for Jesus to come, this was the first coming. Now, we benefit because Jesus came, redeemed man, came into uh, death and resurrection, and now we sit here and we come and we, we recognize the advent candle of something coming, meaning the second coming. But it prepares us for what really the Christmas season is all about, and that's the birth of a Savior. It's the birth of Jesus Christ, which brings us here today is what we look at. So, scripture-wise, this table is really kind of a wobbly one. You ever been at Starbucks and there's eight packs of matches under one side of the table? That's this table, but the matches are missing. Oh, well. So, Matthew 18 states this. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph was her husband, was faithful to the law, and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She'll give birth to a son, and you, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. That's Isaiah 7, 14, of which some are read. Now, in the aspect of where the virgin is said, Luke 126 states, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, the town of Galilee. A virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel of the Lord went to her and said, greetings, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to call him Jesus. And he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him a throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever and ever, and this kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come over you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so the Holy One will be born, will be called the Son of God. When Joseph woke and he woke up and he did what the angel had said of the Lord and commanded him. He took Mary home as his wife, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth, and he gave him the name Jesus. Pretty powerful stuff. Prophesied forward. Manifested. Placed into the place, as you see here, is, is our walk in life easy? No. No. The betrothal process before the actual wedding took place was the, almost the same as the wedding in the Jewish faith. So he was betrothed to her, it could be up to a year. So he's locked into this relationship 
We would maybe call it courting, but that even fails to what the level of commitment was to betrothal. So Joseph's in this relationship, and now his wife is pregnant. His soon-to-be wife is pregnant. What a scandal. What a thing. What's he going to do? God, in his workness, in his, in his uniqueness, comes and he says to Joseph, this is what's going on. How would you be if you were Mary at that juncture where the, the angel came? First off, the angel came and is talking to you. That's a trip in itself, right? So then he comes and he says, hey, you're going to get pregnant. You're going to carry the Son of God. How? I'm a virgin. Oh, the Holy Spirit's going to come on you. Oh, okay, well, if it pleases the Lord, let it be so. Now, she's in her mind realizing, I am betrothed to Joseph. We have not consummated the marriage, but yet I am carrying a child. So within this culture, this is a stonable offense. This is just not something that's acceptable. But yet, she accepted it. Joseph accepted it and said, we'll move forward and we'll embrace this. And we know the rest of the story. She gives birth to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Son of God who comes in. So, hope is a person. You know, we may try to articulate what is hope in our world today, and it's hope is a person, and the person is Jesus Christ. As I was studying for this, you know, we've all gone through circumstances in our life where we hope something works out well, or we've been in a crisis where we're hoping that the tide turns and something changes. Maybe it's a physical thing, maybe it's a, a mental thing, maybe it's an addictive thing, maybe it's whatever. And we hope and we move in that realm. And through this time, I just got the revelation, I've been a believer for a long time, that no matter what, our hope can only lie in God which gives us the ability to deal with whatever else filters in, whether it be hardship, whether it be great things. I mean, all, we can all deal with great things very easily. But the hardships are the hard part. But it gives us the hope that Jesus is one day returning and he's going to make all things right. And if that means we have hardship in our life, that hardship will end. If there's health issues, that health issue will end. There's addiction issues, those addiction issues will end because our hope is a person. And if someone says to you, how can you be so hopeful? All you got to say is Jesus. Because there is nothing that you and I can do for the state of which we found ourselves in, of which Christ returned for. And that's lost, sinful beings. The chasm was so broad, the only bridge that could fill it was Jesus and the cross. And God knew this. And he came in and he spoke those things out. And we say, well, what about this second coming? In Revelation, it says, behold, I'm coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay everyone for what he has done. John 14, 1, 3 says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would not have told you that I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself to where I am. You will also be. This is the promise of the hope that we believers today stand on because Jesus already came and he's coming again. So the hope we lit today is the hope that brought us into salvation, that Christ has done this by faith we receive it, and the hope that we look to for tomorrow is he's coming again. And all the promises that he stated are true and real and yes and amen. So for the rest of our journey, we look through the glimmer of hope and out of that, if you figure out the rest of the candles, it's hope, peace, joy, and love. So they're all connected. And through it is the Christ candle in the middle. So he gives us the hope. We wrestle and we sit in the peace. We emulate the love. And we stand in his grace. And you have a lot of joy. You thought I forgot joy in there. I did. But I was so joyful that it came out later. If you take the gospel, I mean, Andy would said it before, I had said it, no one had her say it all the time. It's simple. It is so simple that you lay out the whole concept in five candles. This wreath actually came back in the 300s where a gentleman took 26, 25 candles and he put them all in there and some were red and some were white and he lit them for his kids to be able to see to be able to count down to what Christmas was, and then they began to shrink it back to where now it's the five. 
And you might go, well, why do we do that for? It's because it's a remembrance of tradition to bring back symbolically what we as believers are supposed to stand in the place to say, let me reposition my thought process. Let me reposition my life. Am I in a place right now that if the King of Kings was coming back on the 25th of December, would I even be ready? But it puts us in the place where if we're hopeless, he gives us hope. Christmas story clearly shows the hope of the universe is a person. Hope was what the angels sang about. Hope lay in a manger. Hope caused Mary to wonder in her heart. Hope is what the shepherds came to worship. Hope was presented with the gifts from the Magi who had traveled so far. The Advent story is hope because it chronicles the coming to earth, the one who brings hope, Jesus. The only solution was for a savior, the only suitable savior with wisdom, power, righteousness to accomplish the task would be God himself. The one deemed, the one denied would be the one to come to rescue. The one rejected would be would move to save the rejectors. The one who had rebelled against the count who had been rebelled against countless times would come to redeem the rebels. The one who had replaced who had been replaced in people's hearts with the endless catalog of idols, would invade the world he had made and rescue people from themselves. We live in a world today where we've created many, many things that sit in the place of where Jesus should sit. We don't call them idols. We call them priorities. We call them things that are more important than what perhaps this particular place should be as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I don't know if you ever struggle with that. I do. I'll be straight and honest with you. The priorities start to crowd in and life gets crazy and it starts to push and it starts to rock where that place should sit. But that's what he came for, is to reprioritize and to place back in that place his lordship. And it's this time that we don't get caught up into all the great sales. We don't get caught up into all the worries of Black Friday because the ships are held off the sea over by California and can't get into the port. We don't worry about that because it's not about that. It's about the reorganizing and the realigning of our hearts to stand in that place of which Jesus came to give place of lordship. That's what it's about. That's what we hope in. He'd not come to set up an earthly kingdom and enforce his rule on the unwilling. He would not come to judge and condemn. He, did, he would not come demanding the service that was his rightful due. He came to serve, to suffer, and to die so his kingdom would reign in the hearts of people. He came to seek. He came to save. He came to suffer. He came to forgive. He came to rescue. He came to restore. He came to call, draw, and love those without his grace would continue to live for themselves. He came, and because he did, there is hope that we as sinners can be redeemed and the world can be renewed. It really is true. Hope is a person, and his name is Jesus. You know, it comes down simply to John 14, 6, where he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. How simple can it be? but yet we make it so complex. Hope is a person. The next time you get disrupted or something of that nature, think back to how am I ever going to get through this? Hope is a person. His name is Jesus. Jesus is the way. God created people to dwell in a loving and worshipful moment-by-moment fellowship with him. We weren't designed to live independently of him. We're not made to figure out life on our own. We are meant to live according to God's will and for his glory. So do we do that today? I mean, is there, is there the question of how do we live our life pleasing unto God? You know, we've, we've, I've had many conversations with people that said, I just don't know what to do with my life. What is God's call on my life? What is, what is God speaking for me to do? I wish he would just tell me. Does anybody have that question? It boils back to the simple place of love him and love people. That's what he wants us to do. Again, how simple. Do we share with people? We've had the great challenge of the opportunity of which we live with each day in our home to be able to try to articulate in a manner for the, the, the mind of a child to understand what the gospel is. 
to be able to give them that concept. And so as we enter into Christmas, maybe you weren't this way as a kid, but it's like, what am I getting? Yeah, what am I getting? So the place we live actually does a really cool thing. They put together this list for each of the children to fill out, and they are able to put on there 10 people that are important to them, which they will get to then go shop in this place of All Star and get gifts, and then they'll wrap the gifts, and then they'll give those gifts to the people that they put on their list. Because what it does is it begins to teach them to give. And now this is not a, it's a secular organization, but it's taking the concept of really what God had intended through Christ, the gift, to give. He gave his life. So then in turn, we are to what? Receive that gift and then give that life. But as we model through, and we, we all think back to when we were kids, I don't know about you, but parents, I believe it's very obvious for the original sin to be seen in selfishness. My kids included. When one had a toy and the other one wanted it, there was a squabble. UFC started a long time ago. It didn't just start in the cage match. It started in the living room on the carpet. And yes, I did wear the striped shirt. Let's do it! Just kidding. It just happens. We struggle with it within our own life. We struggle in our world today, and it's called entitlement. Entitlement doesn't see what the gift that was given, because it was given not entitled, but because he came while we were yet sinners and died for us. That's where our hope camp sits. That's where Jesus is the only way to God. God sent Jesus as the ultimate physical reminder of the depth of our need. Jesus is the truth from God. It's no exaggeration to say that Jesus came to earth as God's ultimate and final sermon. He didn't communicate God's truth. He was God's truth. First, in a way that had never been done, he revealed to us the Father, as he said in John 14, 9, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. How many of us within our life, when somebody asks you, well, what, is, what does God look like? You know, it's hard to, to articulate he's a spirit. He's always been and always will be, and he's everywhere. Well, I don't understand that. And you know, if we're honest, it's difficult to get your head around it, except when you take the part of the incarnate God, Jesus who he sent down so man could connect and understand truly man, truly God, to be able to relate with, struggle with, never fail, but yet at the same time deal with temptation as man does, but yet be successful. This is the ultimate sacrifice. This is the final sermon of his life on earth and then choosing to surrender it. He revealed God's redemptive plan to us. Hanging on a cross, he demonstrated how the plan to deal with our sin, he sent a Savior to die in our place. Jesus is the truth from God. Jesus is life. He doesn't just preach life, he is life. Ephesians 2.1 says that you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked. So what does a dead person need? resurrection. They need resuscitation. Jesus came to point out the fact of how far we're lost, and there's no way to get back. You know, the systematic part of the sacrifices that were given were appeasements. They were atonements for the sin. They still dealt with these things, with the offerings that they went into, but Jesus came and said, this is the final one. God had set it up to retake back what had been taken from the garden that time, to say, now is finished, as Jesus said on the cross. And you and I have the freedom to enter boldly into the throne because he did what he did on the cross and he did it for you. And that's why we sit and we recognize hope this season. But as I studied for this, I also realized, why is it that only during this season do we hear Isaiah 9, 6, where God is going to send his son and, and upon his shoulders the government will rest and he's called everlasting prince of peace, mighty God, counselor. Why is it that it's only this holiday season that we think about this? There's the other 364 days, I'm going to say, because Christmas is one day. So that rest of the year, we don't think about Isaiah 9, 6. We don't think about uh, Isaiah 7, 14. 
But that's the crux and the basis of what Jesus came about was the prophetic message that states him indifference to the other things that are out there. That's hope. That's where hope sits. Hope is a person. Jesus came to be that life giver. He came to call it, conquer the ultimate result of sin, death. His resurrection was the first fruit in a myriad of, a resurre of resurrections to come. And by grace, his spirit would breathe new life into all who would put their trust in him. He came as life to defeat the power of death. Hope is here and now, and hope is in the great forever. That is to come rests on his shoulders. It rests on the almighty shoulders of Jesus, who is here for you today. He offers you what we have no power to do, to restore a relationship with God. Is that somebody's phone? That's my phone. That's not my phone. But you got a ring. See how easy it is to confuse the guy standing out front? Just let that ring out. He offers you freedom. He offers you hope. You know, as you sit in a church like this, we all take for granted that most of us, all of us, have surrendered our life to Jesus Christ because we've known each other, we've walked together. We just expect the fact that, oh, yeah, they're saved, don't worry about it, yeah. Barna did a study, oh, I don't know how many years back, but he said one in nine, out of, out of, one in ten out of your pew don't know the Lord. They come to church. I'm not pointing any fingers or saying anything negative. I'm just stating for our own being, we know where we sit. And is, is God, is Jesus Lord of your life today? Maybe you've made a commitment at some point, maybe you haven't. But even us that have made commitments and said, Jesus Christ is Lord, I'm not questioning the salvation side, I'm questioning the lordship side. The part where it comes down to, yes, we can celebrate, but I want to really lean into the part of what this for is for, is preparatory mental spiritual attitude as we enter forward. So I would just ask you to do the check in yourself. Where am I at walking with the Lord today? Am I where I want to be? I mean, that's a dangerous question because maybe you're really comfortable and you aren't stressed because you don't do anything with God. I don't know. I can't answer the question. But I've talked to a few people that until the Lord reveals to you that you're in a very dangerous seat, we don't know we're sitting in the seat. So I'm trying to call you to attention to say, do an evaluation, an inventory of yourself. That's what Advent's for. If you do, you may see some areas of correction, some change. This was actually looked upon as fasting and praying through as it comes to this time, which is really the opposite of what we live, right? Because Christmas is a time of eating. Christmas is a time of working out in November up till Thanksgiving, so we lost and we're ready to go so that we can eat wholeheartedly from Turkey Day on till ham. And then once ham's over, New Year's comes and it's all the toxic junk, and my resolution is no more of that. <laughs> so you eat it all, New Year's Eve. Yeah, maybe you don't work like I work, but I'm full on New Year's Day. <laughs> Jokingly, kid kidding aside. We all know where we sit. So th let this Advent season be a time for you to really realign. And maybe you're in that spot and you're the best you've ever been spiritually. That's great. That's fantastic. We have the greatest opportunity moving up through this month. We have a Christmas Eve service that's coming up here on a Friday night. We've got cards in the back, the invitation cards that are nice. <clears throat> you know, I don't know, maybe some of you don't like talking to people, but it's pretty easy to go, hey, um, you're not doing something Christmas Eve, here you go. They're really nicely done. It's an opportunity to start doing what we're supposed to be doing, and that's evangelizing. That's putting Jesus in front of people so that God moves through that and ignites into their heart and goes, wow, you're right. Because as he said, no man comes to the Father except through Christ. But God draws them, and he uses us sometimes to do that. So as we enter into this season... I would just encourage you to be mindful because the posture of people changes. Just go shopping. People are nice. People are like, hey, yeah, sure. Have you found yourself yet? <clears throat> it's pretty early yet to say, Merry Christmas. Have you found yourself saying, Happy Holidays? 
simple. It comes back to what do we sit in? I was in a conversation a little bit this morning during setup of the place we sit in our culture. And our culture has pretty much just created a hodgepodge of whatever. We've thrown in a lot of ingredients and we've stirred it and we call it life. We have the opportunity to be the definitive defining ingredient and that's Jesus that changes the entire stew. It turns it back into something that is honoring unto God and life-changing for eternity, as it just stated earlier. Romans 15, 12 says again, and again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise to rule over the nations. In him the Gentiles will have hope. This is Jesus. In closing, as the worship team comes up, I want to ask you to just take a moment of reflection of where I sit in my life, not me, but you, with the Lord. Am I in a position to where I feel like I'm, th I'm thriving in my walk with the Lord? Am I in a position where I feel like I'm losing ground? Am I feel in a position where perhaps I go to church and that's about it? I honestly don't really talk much about God. But I, I know that I go to church and that's where I'm at. And as you think about those things, I would just encourage you to allow the Holy Spirit to direct you. Because we sit in a place where hope is a person. And the person knows you by name. And they know what you struggle with. They know you struggle with the areas in your life that he could change. Romans 15, 13 says, And may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I'll read that again. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, I, I purposely wanted to leave this message short and simple solely because that's really what it's all about it's very simple and the hardest thing we have to get through is ourself so as God fills you with hope let him overflow you let him bring you to the place because repentance is a gift and as we find ourselves in that place of repentance, we find that self of realignment. It's a gift. And he gave it to us through Jesus. Father, we thank you for your goodness today. Oh, we thank you for Jesus. We could just sit and think upon the name of Jesus because there is no other name. And in that name is life. In that name is hope. In that name is peace. In that name is love. In that name is anything that we can put in there that we struggle with because you are the embodiment of peace, of hope. So Lord, I ask for your grace to be poured out right now on each person in this room that you'd help us to really wrestle with ourselves to come to the place where it is ultimate surrender. We abandon what we think we are and what we need and Lord, we humble ourselves and come to you you may fill us afresh with your hope, with your grace and with your goodness and with your love. And Lord, may we make a difference in the circles of which you've placed us because we have hope and hope is a person and you choose to use that within us today. And Lord, we lift all these things to you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.